Good morning, Siobhan. You might have to unmute yourself. I, I don't know if I No, you're you're back. Okay, well, good. Well, first of all, thanks for being here, Siobhan. It's uh, it's always a pleasure to get to talk to you. Um, where are you? Sorry, <laughs> my closet here, and if you close the door, the lights go out. I get that lighting there. I gotta hide from the rest of the folks in the house because it's too much too much noise otherwise. Where are you located these days? Are you in the US? Are you in Sweden or where? I mean, I can't remember where you used to run, run, sneak well, off to, but not Sweden. where are you located today? Uh, I'm from, uh, located in Boulder, Colorado. I actually live with Amber O'Hearn. Oh, okay. Well, I'll say hi to Amber. Awesome. <laughs> was, uh, yeah, hopefully things are going well for you. Are you still are you still spending time working with Dave Feldman? Is that still part of your your sort Yeah, of yeah. So we actually do? started a, a company together. Um, we started On Your Labs, what like a year or two ago, probably like two years at this point. Um, and that's a lab reselling kind of business. And then people have the opportunity through that to opt in uh, to the anonymized database where they're lab results will be submitted along with some demographic data. And then the identifying information will be subtracted from that. So name, location, all that type of stuff. Um, and we'll be posting that database, the first huge list of the results that people have opted in as soon as we hit a thousand submissions, which should be pretty soon. So that's exciting. Now, is this, is this primarily I know because Dave's interest is in lipidology and you've used, I mean, I know you, that's at least a, a significant part of your focus. Is that uh, um, what that's going to entail primarily? Um, so it's pretty much whatever people want to test because uh, with the opt-in, you get a 10% discount. So sometimes people just throw it on. Um, so lots of people do thyroid testing, inflammation testing, uh, lipid testing, hormones, all sorts of stuff all over the place. And along with that demographic data that we're getting, some of the stuff we ask is about the diet. So we ask, are they carnivore? Are they plant-based? Uh, are they keto, low carb? That type of stuff. Percent of protein in the diet is a question that we added because we thought it'd be of some interest. And then body composition and how long they've been on the diet as well. Yeah, interesting stuff and we're, we're doing something very kind of kind of similar with that now there's i mean i think i think this crowdfunded uh data if you want to call it that is, is going to be a, a paradigm shifting uh way to approach disease i really do yeah um, i certainly hope what are you so. learning what's the newest thing i mean i i, I know you're not different. what's what's the latest thing you guys are you guys are focusing on i know dave is Kirk, if I remember, I think he's finally funded his study to do the lean mass hyperresponder yeah, study. So I don't yeah, know if the study has launched. So <laughs> he's busy with the study right now because that's launched and the recruits are flying out to the testing facility. So every time I talk to him, he's like, I'm working on the study. Uh, for me, one thing I've gotten into recently is uh, learning about a lot about lipedema. Uh, at the beginning of the year, I think like March or something, I actually got diagnosed with lipedema myself. Uh, and lipedema is a loose connective tissue disorder because fat is loose connective tissue and it causes disproportionate fat growth, uh, usually in the lower body. And then I also have it in the arms and it's real, real fun to deal with. <laughs> um, so I've been learning a lot about that and kind of what goes into it. And a couple months ago, also earlier this year, uh, I did a presentation on essentially my model for what I think is happening with lipedema because as soon as I figured out I might have it, I ended up doing this huge deep dive into absolutely everything I could find. So, <laughs> so I did that for the uh, uh, lipedema awareness month through lipedema simplified. Well, well, let's touch on that because I've, I've sort of looked a little bit at that topic. I'm not an expert on it, but I, I certainly, you know, I see a lot of particularly women. It seems to be disproportionately, you know, you know uh, displayed by women. But what, what do you think is going on physiologically? I'm sure there's a multiple things to go into. What do you think the major drivers are for this? And, and is, there, is there potential for uh, treatment, I suppose? Yeah, so there's definitely potential for treatment. Um, there's a whole bunch of therapies that you can do currently. And the main ones that were available are things like uh, compression gear to help move fluid out of the affected areas, um, exercises to pretty much do the same thing, massage. But one interesting thing is that this year, especially 
one thing that's been the focus for treatment is a ketogenic diet. And previously, like before that, they were like, diet is not effective. It doesn't really do anything for lipedema. And I think they had that impression because they were focusing on calorie restriction. And the problem with lipedema is that not only are you growing the fat, but it also becomes fibrotic. So it essentially scars over. And then even if you starve yourself, it's not going to come off because it's damaged tissue, essentially. So it's like, well, what do you do after that? And then the other question is, um, how do you deal with progression? And in a lot of cases, like over 80% or so, um, a lot of women report daily pain with it and it can be really severe and there's issues with swelling. So it's like, what do you do? And it seems like keto is actually looking like <laughs> a good, uh, a good, you know, adjunct therapy for that along with all the other stuff. Um, so what I essentially think is happening is I think it's, there's a lot of evidence for it being a connective tissue disorder. And so what I talked about in that essentially hypothesis presentation was I think it might be a connective tissue disorder impacting the kind of structure surrounding the subcutaneous fat. And that's resulting in the fat when it grows, it's not like growing in correctly and it's not supported correctly. And then you get this damage to the tissue and then you have the scarring. And there's lots of signs of connective tissue problems with lipedema. Um, there's the leaky capillaries, there's hypermobility is very common. Um, so I got diagnosed with hypermobility as well. I'm very bendy, bendy, bendy. <laughs> um, oh yeah, and then the skin thing, skin is super stretchy. Um, so what was actually fun is that I got to talk to uh, Karen Herbst who actually diagnosed me. And she's done a ton of papers on lipedema that I had read before I went into the appointment. So while I was there, I was asking her a bunch of questions like, uh, do you think the fibrosis, the scarring in the fat tissue is because of hypoxia? And she's like, yeah, could be <laughs> very possible. Um, so I got to ask her a bunch of questions. And so, yeah, I think it's a connective tissue problem with the fat specifically. And I think women are affected because with women, they tend to grow their fat a little bit differently. And first of all, it would explain the disproportionality uh, because it's, it tends to happen in like female areas, like the lower body. Um, but then not only that, with women, when they grow fat, men tend to have the fat cells that they have and then they just grow them in size predominantly. And then women tend to grow new ones. And like, there's this whole thing where a bunch of little objects as opposed to a couple big objects has more surface area. And from the connective tissue aspect, it means one, you have more overall connective tissue that needs to be maintained, needs to be built and like all of this. And so all of that is gonna require more overall materials because you just have more tissue overall. And then also it's kind of like, it's all, supporting each other and if it's messed up in the connections I think that can add a lot more stress to it as it grows in that surface area. Um, so it's kind of interesting with keto and carnivore actually uh, because plenty of women in the lipedema group that I'm in are carnivore as well as keto. Um, it reminds me of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome as well which is another connective tissue disorder and I've seen people and a relative of my boyfriend's actually has said that low carb and keto and even carnivore helps. So it's like, oh, maybe that's another aspect of what keto is helping here. Yeah, I mean, you're, you know, when you talk about the different fat cells between males and females, describing the difference between hypertrophy and hyperplasia, you know, growing more versus growing bigger cells. And then Ehlers Danlos, which, you know, you know is, is a not that uncommon of a, of a connective tissue disorder. And we've seen, definitely seen people improve that but you're my thought about i'm just wondering when you say it so a ketogenic diet what do you think the ketogenic diet is affecting is it affecting you know is it maybe there's lower insulin does insulin have a role in in perhaps promoting the growth of this sort of aberrant tissue why do you think a ketogenic diet has a so i think it's impact? a couple a couple different things i actually did another presentation recently where i was talking about exactly this like why is a ketogenic diet helping with lipedema and why does it seem to be uniquely helpful in some cases? Like I've seen a lot of women comment, like I've tried a whole bunch of other diets and this is the only one that makes a difference for me. And I think 
Yeah, it's a couple things. I think one aspect is probably the improved metabolic health overall. Um, I talked about in the presentation how, you know, it's not like you have like metabolic syndrome or like poor metabolic health and that's just like it. It's like a separate problem. Like every problem that you have, you have to deal with. And that's taking up resources to heal tissue. It's taking up like all of this stuff. It's a pressure on the immune system. Um, I mentioned one study where they were talking about how metabolic syndrome can negatively impact immunity. And like, it's really tempting to simplify down the immune system to, oh, it's just dealing with infection, but that's not true. The other things that deals with it has to deal with repairing tissue and then also maintaining tissue. And if with lipedema, there's tissue damage happening, then having poor metabolic health may just stack on top of that and make it more difficult to deal with where it's just like another problem <laughs> on top of the other problems you have of fatty liver or hyperinsulinemia or whatever it is. Um, and then another thing is that has like a cascade on a whole bunch of other things because with poor metabolic health, it's often associated with a higher need for inflammation and the inflammatory signaling can impact things like the lymphatics and make them less effective. And the role of the lymphatics is to remove fluid from the tissues and help recirculate it and have this healthy system going where your blood vessels are bringing in fluid and nutrients and then your lymphatics removes it. And with lipedema in the early stages, there's not really an issue with the lymphatic function. It does appear to be normal. Um, but in later stages, it can become kind of messed up. So trying to prevent that as much as possible may be helpful. And then also with lipedema, there's like an inflow problem. So the capillaries are really leaky and bringing in a bunch of fluid. So trying to support the lymphatic system in every way you can may be helpful. Um, and then also just the ketones themselves, I think, may be an important aspect because I mentioned that there may be hypoxia in the tissue and they have found signs of that. And the hypoxia is essentially low oxygen in the tissue. And with the fat cells themselves, it can cause them uh, to become fibrotic. And they can demonstrate that directly. It's like there's this direct pathway of hypoxia, and then there's the hypoxia inducible factor, and then fibrosis. And the ketones are interesting in two respects. One of them is that they're very helpful in hypoxic situations generally because when they're metabolized, they produced more ATP compared to glucose. So you get more usable energy from them. And one of the issues with hypoxia is you need oxygen to metabolize things like glucose and fatty acids and ketones. So it's a bit of like an energy limiter in a way, like it's acting as a bottleneck. And not having enough energy can obviously be uh, very damaging to tissue. <laughs> so you kind of don't want that to happen if possible. Um, and then the other thing that actually Amber pointed out is that ketones are kind of partially metabolized already by the liver. And so it's like requiring less oxygen to metabolize them anyway. So first of all, it requires less oxygen to fully metabolize them to ATP. And then also you get more ATP from them. So it may help with the energy crisis situation in the tissue if that's happening. And then the other interesting thing is that I found a paper that was talking about fibrosis and they pointed out this hypoxia inducible factor and they were messing around with mice and they found that if they introduced BHB, then it would block that pathway. So it's like, oh, maybe that's also helpful. Maybe the ketones are acting as the signaling molecule. And essentially they were talking about how the ketones were acting as a signal of lots of available energy and all this type of stuff. Uh, so I think it's a whole bunch of different factors. And then I also think the connective tissue thing is worth exploring. Like there's a couple of different ways that keto might be helping with that. And one of them is like connective tissue requires lots of nutrients to maintain <laughs> and build. Um, and I read one paper talking about Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and talking about how there may be a nutritional aspect to the disorder. Um, and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and lipedema have actually been compared to each other a little bit because they have similarities. And even in that paper, they were outlining the symptoms of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome that reflected um, possible nutrient deficiencies or could be influenced by that. And some of them were similar, like easy bruising. With lipedema, you can have very easy bruising in the affected areas because the capillaries are very fragile, uh, which is probably a result of uh, connective tissue abnormalities. And then, um, so they had a couple different things. 
And so they were talking about vitamin C and magnesium, uh, carnitine, and it's like, oh, <laughs> well, a ketogenic diet may help because first of all, like it's at least properly formulated, it can be a very nutrient rich diet. So it may help supply those things, but then also metabolism can change depending on you know, whether you're in this crisis state of hyperinsulinemia and immune overtaxation and all this type of stuff. And that can use up resources. Like they've speculated folate can be lower during inflammation, maybe because it's being used more. Uh, vitamin D can be driven down by uh, in inflammatory signaling. Uh, and then, yeah, so <laughs> it's like, maybe it's not only supplying nutrients, maybe it's also making them more available because you're not using them as much. And then another aspect is you may be wasting less. Like magnesium, for example, if you have insulin resistance in the kidneys, you'll start wasting magnesium and they can see that in type two diabetes. And so it's just like overall this <laughs> three hit, like we're supplying lots, we're preserving them and we're not needing them as much. And then obviously with carnivore, there's stuff like carnitine maybe helping to spare vitamin C. So I think it's impacting on like those fronts of the lymphatics, metabolic health, connective tissue health. Uh, and then, yeah, so lots of the ketone factor as well. <laughs> so it's pretty exciting because there's just so many avenues <laughs> to explore with it. Oh, you got to unmute. Sorry, I was going to ask Siobhan if you know that, uh, or, or if you have any insight into this. Uh, you know, we've seen the, the quality of human fat has changed, you know, significantly over the last five or six decades, you know, when they do actual biopsies and they've done this. And some people would point to, uh, you know, the different oils that are in the diet that you didn't used to be. Does that have a role here in, in lipedema or cellulite or any of those types of things? I, I have, you know, my suspicions, but have you said anything that, that would suggest that? Now, if you go to a ketogenic diet, most people give up the corn oil and the soybean oil, maybe not everybody, but what, certainly on the carnivore diet you do, but what are your thoughts on, on the different oils and, and how they deposit as fats? Yeah, I don't know about that specifically. I mean, if things like seed oils, the canola and the soy and all that type of stuff, if they're generating toxic byproducts, if they're inducing more oxidative yeah. stress, I could see that having an impact just by being another stressor. Um, it, I mean, there's even scenarios with lipedema where positive stressors, which are really good things that are happening, can trigger or worsen symptoms like puberty. I mean, that's a good thing to happen. Pregnancy, that's a good thing to happen. But for one, you're adding fat, which may be a stress. And then also you're having like this, I mean, you have to build up a whole ton. You have to grow a human being or grow yourself. And it's just like one more thing on the to-do list for the body. So I think factors like that or, you know, foods that you're sensitive to, for example, I think that might not help. <laughs> um, so seed oils may be playing into that. I don't know that I've ever seen anything where they like took a biopsy of lipidemic fat and looked at the fatty acid composi composition in it to see if it's any different. That would be interesting, I think. Um, but honestly, with lipidema, like... <sighs> It was only like named in the 40s, really, which is pretty recent in terms of research. And then there's just a whole ton we're still learning about it. Like it's in this massive phase where we're still trying to figure out what's going on, <laughs> like have a good model for what's happening and then try to figure out where there's good areas of research. Um, so Leslin Keith is of course focusing on that and she does lipidema simplified and actively advocates for ketogenic diets for lipidema. Uh, and then also Karen Herbst on the other side, she advocates more for plant-based diets, but she's also doing a lot of really cool research with it. So I'm hoping like as we keep going forward, we'll learn more stuff about it and we'll have good questions like that. Like if someone is including seed oils in the diet, do they have a recurrence of pain? Do they have worsening symptoms? Do they find that it's making them worse? And if so, like why is that? Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating that, you know, it wasn't really defined until the 1940s, which either says, you know, they just didn't look for it or it's become more frequent, which is pretty plausible. I, mean, I it wouldn't more... be surprised if it were both. One problem with it, though, is it was often confused with obesity. And even with obesity, like I've been obese before, 
Um, I have experienced this of, oh, you're not losing weight, like eating 800 calories a day. You're lying. You're not complying. You're whatever. You're sneaking food in the middle of the night, even if it's not true. And with lipidema, it's even worse because you could literally starve yourself and it's not going to affect the areas. And then women have gotten this response from their doctor of, oh, you must not be complying in some way. You must be miscounting when really it's <laughs> a disorder. And it's like, no, <laughs> no. Um, so it can kind of happen on both fronts. So it's not too, too surprising that it only got identified in the 1940s. Um, it's, yeah, a lot of problems. And yeah, that is a question I always have with anything where they're like, oh, it's genetic. <laughs> it's like, well, how often does it happen in indigenous societies or in people with healthy diets? Like Okinawa, when they were living in their Haiti, was it super common there? Like, that should be the first question because if it's more common in like Western countries, I don't think it's solely genetic. It can definitely have a genetic component. And I do think in this case it does. I think the connective tissue component is uh, inheritable. Like I don't actually get it from my mom. I think I actually get it from my dad. Uh, he has a whole bunch of connective tissue disorder symptoms and mom is suspected he has something like Marfan syndrome for a long time. And it's like, oh, <laughs> thanks dad. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's another one of those, you know, genetics loading the gun and, and environment pulling the trigger type of situation. Yeah. You, and I think say. there's definitely something to lend to that, especially because lifestyle is helping. Like for me, I haven't really had any progression in symptoms since I started the ketogenic diet. So my legs and everything are pretty much the same size. And the only exception to that is when I did my high carb experiment back in 2019. I noticed that after that experiment, I gained like 17 pounds and I'm only five foot two. So that's a lot for me. And it took a lot of time to get that back off. I had to stop eating dairy, all this stuff. And then I had gotten a DEXA before that experiment, um, like a couple months before. And then I recently got a new one. And after that experiment, I was like, are my shirts fitting different? since that experiment because that's weird <laughs> and then I got the updated DEXA and it confirmed I gained uh, probably lipidemic fat in my arms and it never went away and also in my lower body as well um, so zero out of ten do not recommend don't do that <laughs> it sucks <laughs> um, and like once the lipidemic fat is there it's really hard to get it off because you're now dealing with scar tissue um, so that's like my next project is trying to see if I can kind of get rid of the scar tissue in a healthy way that'll kind of encourage my body to remodel without forcing it and beating it into submission. <laughs> it's just like, you can do it. <laughs> Come on. So providing a really there, healthy. There's a question in here. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Siobhan. There was a question here about surgical treatments, you know, either excision or a liposuction type thing. Does that have any efficacy? Does it just recur? What's, what's the literature on that show? Um, yeah. So let's see. There are sur surgical options. So there's um, lymphatic sparing liposuction, I think is what's usually recommended. So you don't damage the lymphatics in those areas. Um, and that can help for some people, um, especially because if lipedema gets really severe, it can impact mobility and there can be a lot of pain and all that type of stuff. So just removing the tissue mass can be helpful. And then there is also uh, lipedema surgery, which is essentially with lipedema, the fibrosis comes in the form of nodules. So it's like little balls of scarred over fat. And that surgery actually removes those directly. Uh, and I did talk to Herbs about that and she said it does seem to be effective. And so far in what they've seen, it doesn't like come back right away. Um, but of course they're gonna wanna observe people long-term. Um, and then non-surgical options, what I'm probably going to go for one option is a stem therapy where you're essentially agitating the scar tissue from the outside with just a mechanical tool. Um, Herbs did say that with that it can be very effective but it does tend to come back and then my next question was well and the people who've seen it come back were they on a ketogenic diet and she's like well no. <laughs> so I'm kind of curious about that like if you do the ASTEM therapy which is a non-surgical option if you could get rid of the scar tissue and if you have like a proper environment if it won't come back so if you're supporting healthy tissue instead of you know having hypoxic tissue that's going to scar back over so yeah there are definitely options 
um, especially for people with severe cases, I think the surgery is a fair option to pick if it's impacting your quality of life. Hey, let's let's shift gears off of the, the lipedema. That's been fascinating. I didn't, I didn't I had no idea we were talking about lipedema today, but let's talk a little bit about lipidology, if you don't mind, since that's been definitely in your wheelhouse. What's new in lipidology? I mean, you know, I know you looked, you know, LPA little a, LP little a, and some of the other things. But what's uh, what what can you say about the state of lipidology in 2021 or almost 2022? Is it just completely confusing and nuanced, or do we have any sort of are we still are we still in this LDL centric mode where where we're just everything revolves around LDL? Or what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I guess it depends on who you're talking to. Um, Dave would probably know a lot better because he's just submerged in it a ton. Um, I think there's definitely a lot of nuance to it, and I think uh, he is working with Nick Norwich, and they're kind of fleshing out the energy model a lot at this point. Um, I haven't kept up with it. <laughs> I've been busy with the lipidema stuff and then also focusing on just a whole bunch of other topics. Um, but yeah, I think it's interesting. I think it'll be interesting to see how the conversation changes over the next couple of years. And I'm hoping we'll see like some interest in, you know, oh, does context change things? Does metabolism change things? Um, because, I mean, Dave has demonstrated that metabolism can have this big impact on lipids, LDL, HDL, all this type of stuff. And then my focus is on the other side of the fence, where uh, how immune activation can impact the lipid profile. And uh, I was just talking to someone about how they were saying, you know, oh, eating carbs causes high triglycerides. And I was like, well, <laughs> there's more nuance to it, to that, right? Because like in infection, for example, there's this whole cascade of things that can cause hypertriglyceridemia, regardless of whether you're eating carbs or not. You could be completely fasting and you can still have the high, trig high triglycerides happening. And that's part of the immune response. So, you know, <laughs> if you're eating a diet that's triggering the immune system for some reason, like say it's acting as an irritant, it's causing tissue damage, I could see someone having high triglycerides from that. And I could see that happening until the signals that are causing it are going away. So even within the low carb community, there's room for nuance of, you know, it's not necessarily all about the carbs, even though, you know, people can have a negative reaction to carbs. So for example, I was just uh, reading a paper actually talking about different responses to different types of uh, different diet compositions, essentially. And they had, you know, high carb meal, high fat meal, uh, high protein meal, and they were testing insulin responses and inflammatory responses in two groups of people. And the first group was obese insulin resistant people. And the second group was lean insulin sensitive people. And they found that the responses between those two groups was different. So with the obese people, they had the high carb meal and their insulin went super high. But then if you look at the insulin sensitive group, like they have a pretty similar response across the board with minor changes. And it's like, oh, maybe this is really important because we're talking about, you know, carbs can be really, really not helpful <laughs> in certain situations in terms of weight loss and, you know, trying to avoid hyperinsulinemia, trying to resolve hyperinsulinemia and maybe triggering this huge insulin spike. And they also found more inf like a higher inflammatory response in the obese group. And it's like, okay, this is kind of what we're saying. Like Gary Taubes talks about how some people fatten easily from carbohydrates and some people don't. And those two people are going to have a different response to the same diet. Well, this is kind of reflecting that same information where it's saying these two different groups are having a different response. And that inflammatory response can have impacts on things like HDL and triglycerides in the long term, if that's a repeated pattern of behavior. And I think the impression I get from reading Taub's stuff is he thinks it's maybe partially genetic. I may be wrong on that, but I think it's environmental. And I think the issue may be if you're in this like state of alarm where essentially you have immune activation already, you may start seeing a different effect from the introduction of carbohydrates. It's like, okay, that's important because it'll help us identify, you know, who's going to benefit and who's probably not and who may not even need to bother. Like, sure, you can follow a carnivore diet for whatever reason you want. Like, it's fine. <laughs> There's plenty of societies who do that. Um, but in terms of therapeutic diets, like, 
I don't want to tell people, oh, everyone has to eat keto or low carb or carnivore because I don't think that's true. And I think this is an important aspect to it. And so <laughs> I kind of got off the topic of lipidology, but it all kind of interconnects of this metabolic health aspect and then the metabolism aspect. Like they overlap over and over and over again. Just it, yeah. <laughs> so you can't really separate them is the thing. Like you can't talk about one without also talking about the other. And if there's a marker that is correlating to poor health, you have to figure out like, can this be influenced by both or just the one? Because if it's both, like you have to figure out if that's associating with harm in both contexts is the thing. And it's so lots of nuance, very complicated, but the great thing is that there's patterns and I love it <laughs> when there's patterns because then you start like seeing the same thing over and over again and you start being able to piece it together and make sense of it. And then it becomes less confusing and less, I mean, not less complicated, but less, I don't know, just confusing, I guess. That seems less random, I suppose. So, so what you're saying is like this, for instance, high triglycerides may, or, I mean, would you say that having relatively higher triglycerides is always a bad thing? Is that something we could, can we say that? Or is that even not, not even something you could say? I mean, it depends on the context. So uh, lots of people come to Cholesterol Code, for example, which is the site that I help Dave run. And they post in the comments and they're like freaking out and they know we don't give medical advice, but they just want our opinion because we see lots of this stuff. And so we can see the patterns and say, oh, you know, in my experience, what I've seen in others, blah, blah, blah. And one of the common ones is they'll say, I have high triglycerides on a test and I'm carnivore and I'm keto and I'm super strict or whatever. And the first question is always, were you 12 to 14 hours water only fasting? <laughs> because number one, if you were non-fasting and you are on a high fat diet, like, guess what you have to do after you have eaten a meal? You now have to traffic those fatty acids to use them or to store them away for later. And they don't like magic themselves into the appropriate areas. They have to travel through the bloodstream. So if you're getting a blood test and you see, you know, like triglycerides of 130 or whatever, and you've just eaten, like, that's not surprising to me <laughs> because you know, that's what you've eaten. It has to travel. And then the other aspect is they'll say, oh yeah, I was fasting, but I had coffee. It's like, okay, well, <laughs> the problem is caffeine can also stimulate lipolysis. So it can stimulate the release of fat. Um, and I've actually wondered if this is why caffeine is acting as a uh, appetite suppressant, because it's allowing you to access more energy from your own fat by causing that lipolysis. So again, it's increasing fat trafficking in the blood temporarily and do I think like if someone tests, uh, like gets a blood test and they had coffee right before the test, if they have triglycerides of 130 and it's caused by that specific thing, is that necessarily bad? I mean, it's up for debate, I guess, but I mean, the research with coffee is it doesn't really associate with poor outcomes and it's probably just a physiological aspect of it. Like, the caffeine is causing this thing and then it temporarily causes an increase in triglycerides, same as eating does. So it's context dependent. It depends. Like I don't think someone is going to have like triglycerides below a hundred all the time, especially on a ketogenic diet, it's going to fluctuate. And the question is, is that physiological or is it a pathological thing? So with the high triglycerides in metabolic syndrome, for example, we can find evidence that it may be caused by this inflammatory cascade and having a need for high levels of inflammation all the time is probably not the best thing in the world. So in that case, it's like, okay, let's, <laughs> let's look into that further, try and figure out what's happening there. Um, and then also we do have associations with hyperinsulinemia, which can come along with metabolic syndrome. And that does, you know, correlate with bad outcomes. So it's like, okay, <laughs> You know, there's reason to believe that is not a good thing and we should probably be addressing that and trying to resolve it. And luckily, you know, we have ways of doing that. Like Verta Health has shown like all this research about ketogenic diets and even, you know, non-ketogenic diets too. If it's helping you improve your metabolic health, I think that's good, <laughs> regardless of how you're doing that, as long as it's sustainable in the long term and, you know, you feel good doing it and it's improving your health all good things. So again, it's like a context thing. And it's why you have to look at these two different contexts of is it energy metabolism? 
And if it is energy metabolism, is that correlating to poor outcomes? Or is it this immune system aspect? And if it is, does that correlate with bad outcomes? And same thing with infection, like I said. Um, if it's severe enough, they have like shown the hypertriglyceridemia of infection. And uh, Feingold has an excellent paper on it where he's discussing this and he says this is essentially a part of the immune response and it's helpful to fight infection and like all this type of stuff in the short term, like that's great. <laughs> like you want to let your body do its thing. Um, try not to like die or get injured in the process, all that. And then it'll resolve itself and go away once the problem is gone. So <laughs> hopefully that answered your question. Yeah, I'm just going to respond. There's a couple of questions in the chat here. I think Bonnie has a question about this. And this is back to the lipidemia stuff, I believe. Um, exercise, does it have a role in lipidemia? And then the other thing was she is asking about pork versus beef. I know that apparently at one point you you favored pork over beef. I don't know if that's still the situation. So if you wouldn't mind addressing that. Yeah. Um, so the exercise thing definitely does. Uh, and a large reason that they encourage exercise is not for weight loss or anything like that. It's actually because muscle contractions help encourage uh, the lymphatic system to remove fluid. So if you're, you know, doing something like yoga or swimming or walking or biking or anything like that, it's going to cause muscle contractions and uh, that'll help with the swelling and things like that. So that is encouraged. Um, and because some women with lipedema can have very large limbs and they can be in a lot of pain, it's pretty much like the exercise that you could tolerate, which I would say for like anyone, <laughs> the exercise you can tolerate is probably the thing to do. And then also the exercise you enjoy because it's got to be a sustainable thing that you can do for, you know, however. So I like walking, so I walk. I like hiking, so I hike. Um, other people like yoga, so they do yoga. Um, weightlifting, all that type of stuff. And then pork versus beef, I think it's a very individual thing. Um, some people say they don't feel as well as pork on pork. Some people say they don't feel as well as chicken. Um, and it just depends. Like I went through my first year of carnivore and it's what, like four years now, something like that. Um, and I ate pretty much exclusively pork, <laughs> like pork and cream cheese was my whole thing. Um, and I got a lot of flack for it because people were like, ah, pork poofas, but I was feeling good and it's what I was craving. So that's what I was eating. And I wasn't going to let other people dictate what I put in my mouth. Um, and like when I tried beef during that period, it just wasn't like, it was like, uh, whatever. And after about a year, I would try some beef and it's like, oh, this is good actually. <laughs> So I wouldn't be surprised if like cravings like that are dictated maybe like, oh, pork has more in it of something that I was low on compared to beef. And so I didn't want the beef and I only wanted the pork. And then once I kind of got those levels up to more normal, it's like, oh, we can start including beef again. And now like over time, it's just like, I'll switch back and forth between them. So all of a sudden I'll be like, I only want to eat pork. I don't want any of this beef. Ugh, gross. And then like a month later, it's like, oh, I want beef again. I don't want any of this pork and I'll have to put it away again. <laughs> so I don't know. I just think people, I don't know. I guess I'm kind of a hedonist in this way, but I think people should eat what they like. <laughs> I don't think they should be forced to eat things they don't like. Uh, yeah, I agree. That includes bug, bugs and soybean slop and all the other stuff that's coming down the pike. But uh, You know, <laughs> anyway. I wouldn't mind. I refuse to buy like bug products because they're always marketed as like a replacement for beef. And I think that's bogus because <laughs> I think beef can be part of a healthy planet and contribute to the health of the planet. I mean, Peter Bowerstead has talked about that endlessly. Uh, but I wouldn't really mind eating bugs occasionally. I think it'd be interesting. Like I've heard like roasted crickets can taste like popcorn. That sounds cool. I'd eat that. I'd probably eat like a tarantula or something, but I don't want to contribute to this like propaganda against beef is my problem. So <laughs> probably I would yeah. get them if I went to like a country where it was like a, a treat that they would serve. I, I don't, you know, I mean, my, my, my substance is they eat that stuff because they don't have anything else better to eat. And, <laughs> yeah, Amber has made that point that it's like a supplementary thing in a lot of cases, and they don't really rely on it solely. And I definitely wouldn't either. But I think in terms of variety, it's just like eating shrimp or lobster. It's, as long as it's interesting and tastes good, I don't really care. I'm not a squeamish person. <laughs> I'll just eat whatever. Like, oh, does it taste good? Okay, whatever. Um, 
yeah i like brain not all the time but that like squeaks a lot of people out and it just doesn't bother me it tastes like egg yolk yeah when i when i had it i didn't i i, I found it very non it didn't taste like anything to me it was pretty it's like a very mild thought. custard and i've made like uh me and amber have made ice cream out of it we called it brain freeze <laughs> that was pretty good um and i've made like bone marrow bone marrow panna cotta like i just mm. like interesting stuff yeah interesting awesome interesting right, well, stuff what, uh, that doesn't make me feel garbage is preferred yeah, I mean that's that's the end of the day, you know, and it's like I said, you eat what you enjoy. I mean, if you don't, if you're not enjoying your diet, then there's no point. I mean, you got to. Yeah. I don't eat liver sure. because first of all, I don't like it, and second of all, when I tried to force it, uh, it made me physically ill, and that's not like a squeamish thing. Like I'll eat brain, no problem, but liver, it's like there's a physical repulsion to it for me, and maybe it has something to do with like the heavy metal content that I'm sensitive to, or like some nutrient that I'm topped off on. But it's like I had that distaste for it, and then I was including it in an experiment, and I was like, I have to keep adding this because it's part of the experiment. And like, the repulsion turned to nausea, and then the nausea turned to being physically ill over the course of about like eight days or something. It's like, oh, so actually, if I like listen to these instincts to not eat something, there's probably a reason for those feelings. So now it's like, okay, if I feel repulsed by something i'm not eating it there's probably a reason for that yeah i'm, I'm with you on the liver i'm not a fan of it i tried it and i've not seen anything that's made me compelled to eat it but anyway for everyone that you know if whatever floats your boat type of thing yeah if um, you enjoy liver so, then good have fun with it yeah so what so um as far as um you know i guess back to some more of the lipid lipidology stuff i mean are we are we is there any uh, like LPIR, lipoprotein insulin resistance score, just came out, you know, last year, earlier this year, and it's a huge determinant of cardiovascular disease based on the women's health study, you know, and a huge, are you a fan of that particular metric? You know, it's basically a combination of, I think it's LDL, VLDL, and, and HDL and particle count, basically, if I'm not mistaken. It's a that. bunch of stuff that they can measure on the NMR, which I think includes other things as well. Um, but I think it's like a proprietary thing, so it's not totally transparent what they're looking at. Um, so I found that it can vary. And again, it's like some things could be influenced by metabolism. Some things could be influenced by other things like exercise. Um, I mean, if it's like super duper high, I would pay attention to that, but I've seen it pop up above the minimum a couple times. And it was like when I was extended fasting, which I don't really do anymore. Um, I've seen it pop up sometimes in terms of like heavy exercising in the days leading up. So like with any marker, I just prefer to keep it in context, uh, like <laughs> just pretty much anything. I mean, if your insulin is like super duper mega high and you're properly fasted, whatever, um, I would definitely pay attention to that. But a lot of stuff, it's like, okay, well, what is this saying as part of the whole? Like, what is it saying along with triglycerides, along with HDL, along with insulin, along with inflammatory markers? Like... HSCRP is a good example. Uh, it's a uh, C-reactive protein cardiac is another thing it's called. And it's a measure of inflammation. So when there's inflammatory signaling, you make more of this protein and then you can pick up that protein in the blood. And the problem is that it can be influenced by a variety of things. So I like it because it's super duper sensitive. But on the other hand, it has to be taken in context like for example, I've had a cold and it went up to 15 and it's like, well, yeah, I have an immune response going on. That makes sense. Um, and then also I've seen it go up in people after exercise. And it's like, okay, yeah, that makes sense because exercise induces inflammation and that's how you grow and repair the muscle. So context with pretty much every marker, I try not to take it in isolation and just kind of build a better picture because the other thing I like about looking at multiple different facets and combining markers is that some things will pick up where other things don't. And so it's kind of like this redundancy system built in. And I used to work in IT, so I like redundancy where possible, where it's like, okay, is this a false signal or is this being redundantly stated in multiple different areas? Or is this a big enough signal that even if everything else uh, looks kind of normal-ish, do I want to look into this further? Um, so LPIR, I do pay attention to it. 
Um, but I mean, <laughs> I guess looking at my own results is just kind of boring because it, it's not that <laughs> it doesn't like pop out super, super much. Sorry, I was muted. Are there any markers that you find that are, are actually valuable? I mean, things that we, you know, obviously, I mean, everybody's familiar with the basic, the basic lipid panel, the, you know, the total HDL, LDL, and the, and the triglycerides. But anything else that that's, that's there that you would say this is this is really important to pay attention to, or or what do you? I mean, let me ask you this question, and this is a, I get this question all the time, and I had, and I suspect the answer would be similar to what I say anyway, but. Someone comes to you and they say, you know, I went on ketogenic diet or low carb diet and my LDL cholesterol went up by a hundred points. What do I do? What do I do? What are your thoughts on that? So for the first question, there are many tests that I like <laughs> looking at. Um, so if someone is like, what should I test? It's like, well, obviously I'm not a doctor. I can't give you medical advice. And it depends on your situation also. Um, but if just doing like a little checkup, typically what I tend to look at is a comprehensive metabolic panel, uh, complete blood count, basic lipid panel, sometimes an NMR if I'm feeling fancy. But usually what I've found is that the lipid panel and the NMR kind of reflect each other. So they have predictable patterns. So it just depends on what my budget is at that time. Uh, insulin, of course, HSCRP, like I mentioned. Um, and then also if I'm like checking into metabolic health, I'll add in GGT or if I'm like exercising a lot, I'll add in GGT because I came across a paper a while ago and I've seen this pop up in people as well, that heavy exercising can influence liver enzymes. Uh, so AST and ALT. And so it can, both of them will go up from intensive exercise and that can sometimes last up to seven days in the studies they're looking at. But GGT, which is also a liver marker, um, it won't. So it can like help clarify the context on it. And then the other one that I've been finding very interesting over the past year, year and a half, two years is Glyca, G-L-Y-C-A. And that is a marker of oxidation and inflammation. And the thing that I found very interesting about it, because I've also gotten like family members, uh, blood work, like I'll buy them blood work, go get your blood work done, <laughs> make sure everything looks okay, um, is in the problem cases where their health is not good, um, or at least not fantastic, could use some improvement, glycae will be up above the range. But in myself and in Dave's stuff, um, and in people who are generally metabolically healthy, it's pretty stable. Um, I think there are definitely certain things that can influence it, like probably running a marathon might have some impact on it, because um, that's a ton of <laughs> repair work needing to be done afterwards. Um, but that is when I like, especially in comparison with uh, HSCRP, because the CRP is very sensitive, and then the glycae is a little bit more stable. Um, so you can have these two kind of adding, working off of each other and then giving you more context. And then uh, for the second question, oh, someone comes to me and says their LEO has gone up. Uh, I mean, I don't tell them whether they should be concerned or not because that's not my decision to make. They kind of have to make that decision. Um, so usually at this point, whenever someone comes to it, it's again, not a doctor, this isn't medical advice. Um, there is reason to believe this may be influenced by metabolism if you've seen it go up specifically from a ketogenic diet. So it was at more nor normal levels and then it went up. Um, but then also, what are your <laughs> HDL and triglyceride levels? What's the context? Um, because, you know, if someone's LDL went up on a ketogenic diet, but their HDL went down and their triglycerides went up, well, I'm personally going to be curious about that. Like, what's going on there? Were they properly fasted? What's the overall context? What are they eating? Because ketogenic diet can mean a gajillion different things. Not all of them are ideal in my opinion. Um, and then also what's the history like? What was your health beforehand? All that type of stuff. And then at this point, usually what I link is, you know, if you want to explore this further, we have um, a presentation from Dave who's talking about risk from the more cautiously optimistic side of things. And then we also have a post from Dr. Spencer Nadowski who kindly wrote it for us so we could have this example of the cautiously pessimistic side. And what I would do and what I did in that situation is I kind of looked at both sides and talked to my doctor at the time about it, um, talked to other people who I respected about it, 
and came to my own decision. And then everyone's decision is going to be different. And then with that also, like there are some people who ultimately decide they're not comfortable with that. And again, that's a personal decision. Um, and we now have a post that's talking about how to lower LDL uh, through dietary measures if it's dietarily induced. Uh, and it's basically just carb swapping. So you decrease the amount of fat you're eating and you proportionally increase the carbs. Um, and usually it's like between 75 to 150 grams of carbs per day. Depends on the person, activity level, all that type of stuff. Um, and then it'll usually bring the level down if it was caused by the diet, which really is not like super high carb. And if they're metabolically healthy, some people can tolerate that fine and they prefer that option at least until we have more information or they feel pretty solid, like I don't feel comfortable for whatever reason. So <laughs> it pretty much ends up being like, what's the context? Um, go look into different opinions, talk to your doctor about it, come to your own decision. And then if you don't like it, here's an option that might work for you depending on the situation. Um, I don't like making decisions for other people <laughs> or telling them what to think. Like that's not my job. I have to think for myself. That's about all I can take. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, I think you just provide information to people to make their own decision. It's just fine. I've got one last question for you, Siobhan. Uh, I'm wearing a shirt that says salt, salt squad stuff here. Um, Dave, Dave famously, or at least he used to, eats a lot of salt. I can't remember he what your situation does. It's ridiculous. Yeah, so do salt, does salt play? I can't imagine it doesn't, but I mean, do we know a relationship between salt intake and lipid and, and lipid, uh, you know, results from that? Does it seem to have a role? Um, I mean, from salt specifically, like impact on lipid metabolism, I don't know. Um, I think it's just like the salt thing is so picky because I think it is very individual. Like me, I don't really salt my food ever, <laughs> like ever, even when I'm not eating cheese, which of course has some salt in it. Like I don't, I just don't have any urge to unless it's something like broth or like I made a stew or something where there's water in the food, then I'll usually salt it. Uh, but other than that, I don't. And I actually recently tried adding in uh, Element, which is an electrolyte supplement, like doing two per day just to see if it had any difference. And I didn't feel any different. And I don't know, it was just annoying and tedious <laughs> for me. Um, so I think it depends on the person. And I also, one factor may be that I don't drink a lot of fluids. Like I drink probably less than a liter and a half per day, sometimes less than a liter. And that's not even going by thirst, like that's including boredom drinking. Boredom drinking, usually coffee, <laughs> like carbonated water, not <laughs> alcohol, obviously. Um, so yeah, in, impact on lipid metabolism, I don't know. Dave might know because he's experimented with his salt intake, but at the very least, he's never said anything about it. So if it does have an impact, at least it wasn't obvious for him. And he's dealing with like super high levels of intake. Um, mostly what I notice with him is if he doesn't get enough salt, he gets cranky and he starts complaining about like muscle cramps and stuff. All right. All right. Well, Siobhan, unfortunately we've zipped through an hour very quickly and I have to go do, do some consultations here in just a minute, but thank you so much. Um, let folks know anything you're working on, any, any way people that might want to follow what you're doing, social media, all that stuff, if you don't mind. Yeah, uh, so Twitter is Siobhan underscore Huggins, S-I-O-B-H-A-N underscore H-U-G-G-I-N-S. I'm sure that will be somewhere, so you don't have to try and spell it. Uh, you can also find me on cholesterolcode.com, where I'll be entering comments. You can find me on Facebook just under my name. Uh, you can find me in the Lipedema group, uh, Keto Way of Eating for Lipedema. That's run by Leslin and Catherine, who uh, suggest ketogenic diets for lipedema if the person feels it's appropriate, of course. Um, and I'll probably be doing uh, more stuff with Lipedema Simplified presentations, working with them on stuff for Lipedema, because uh, I think it's a worthy cause and it's just, there's not enough people working on it. So I would like that to change. Awesome, well, thanks. thanks. And then once again, the company you and Dave started about the labs, is that- ah, what is Own it Your Labs. Like? So it's ownyourlabs.com, O-W-N-Y-O-U-R-L-A-B-S.com. So feel free to check us out and we always recommend comparison shopping with other people. Awesome. Well, give my regards to both Dave and Amber. Thank you for being here and we look yeah, forward we'll to talking to you yeah. down the road again, Simon. Okay. Thanks for having me. All right, me. guys, we'll see you.
see everybody tomorrow. You guys have a great day. Bye-bye now. Join Rivero.Health for a 30-day free trial to get access to live Q&A with VIP guests, social community meetings, member discounts, low-carb healthcare providers list, forum, workouts, monthly challenges, early access to podcasts, recipes, carnivore diet guide, fasting guide, shred guide, and much more. 